On September 20th, 1922, in the small agrarian community of Tuscola, Mississippi, Bessie Barnett gave birth to William Oscar Barnett, who was to be her only child. Aunt Molly was the housemaid, and after the delivery, the doctor handed the baby to Aunt Molly. She cleaned him and presented the baby to his mother and said, The doctor is just fine. The two had decided that if the baby was a boy, then he should become a doctor, and after that almost everyone around Tuscola called young William Doctor or Doc. Young William grew up in a two-story white house, and for most of his childhood, school teachers, usually three of them, boarded at his home because it was the only house in the community with enough room for them. There was one bedroom downstairs and three upstairs where the teachers stayed. No indoor plumbing, no electricity, and water was drawn from a well. Every bedroom had a fireplace. That's how everyone kept warm in the winter. Bessie Barnett was a very smart lady. She taught herself to play the piano and later gave lessons. She gave lessons to young William, but he didn't do too well. For one thing, he thought it was sissy at the time, but that it was all right for girls. Once or twice a week, Bessie would play the piano, accompanied by her husband, John Henry, who played the violin, and they would all sing. That was the family entertainment back in the 20s and 30s. Since electricity wasn't available, and in order for his mother to see her music, it was young William's job to watch the oil lamp sitting on the edge of the piano and turn the pages of her music. The Barnetts weren't wealthy, but they were the most affluent people in the community. They had a 200-acre cotton farm and a small country store next to the big white house. John Henry and Bessie ran them both. Young William started working in the fields when he was about 10 years old, which would be 1932, hoeing and picking cotton. He didn't do much picking because that would always be about the time school started, and with his mother, school took precedent over everything. William lived way back in the country and went to a little grammar school there. There was a little school in Lena where most children went after they finished grammar school. His mother looked into it and decided it didn't offer some of the subjects he would need as Lena didn't teach chemistry or Latin because nobody was interested. So she and John Henry talked to his brother who lived in the county seat in Carthage, nine miles away. They had a better school there. Oscar Hugh Barnett was a circuit judge for 30 years. He was a rigid individual and didn't put up with much foolishness. But he was always good to William. He would lend him his car when he was old enough to drive and always gave William encouragement. At the age of 13, William left home and went to stay with his aunt and uncle and attend Carthage High School through the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. He never lived at home with his mother and father after he was 13 and homesickness was a considerable problem for a while. There were no telephones, and he saw his parents only on the weekends. William really locked in on becoming a doctor when he was in the 11th grade. Until then, he was only going to school because people said, or because his mother said, you're supposed to. His mother would say, now if you want to stay around here the rest of your life and do this, you know how your hands feel and everything. That's your decision but I'd advise you to go on to college and study something. William got constant reinforcement from home. His father had given him a little incentive too. That first year at Carthage, when he wasn't doing so well, his parents were driving him back to school one Sunday afternoon and his father said, now you're gonna to have to do better on that Latin. And that's when he made a big mistake. He said, but daddy, that Latin is real hard. His father pulled the car over and stopped it on the roadside, turned off the ignition switch and said, Now let me tell you something right now. You either make a B on that Latin or on the next go-round. I'll turn this car around and you can go back with me to the field to help us make a crop. You'll see what's hard. William never told him anything was hard after that. He knew he meant what he said. He wasn't as devoted to William going to college as his mother was. He never discouraged it in any way, but most of what William accomplished was with his mother's encouragement. He wanted to make as good a grade as he could in high school because two young men he knew had gone to Ole Miss the year before. One guy caught cheating and was kicked out of school, and the other one just flunked out. 
So right then he decided that he should do the best he could, really try to learn. And it wasn't necessarily because he wanted to make good grades, but because William had discovered that learning was fun. And of course the grades would come if you applied yourself. Then the question came up about where to go to college. John Henry had relatives that were all strong Baptists and his mother wanted to go to Mississippi College, a Baptist school in Clinton. But Bessie reasoned that if you want to be a doctor, then go to a medical school. She called the university and found out they had a two-year medical school and then you could go somewhere else to finish up. That was fine with William. But the first thing was to get in. If you ever got in medical school, you could pretty well stay there. Getting in was a problem. Fortunately, William's grades were good enough and he was accepted. Uncle Oscar, the judge, had just gotten a new car. So on a September Sunday morning, William, the judge, and John Henry drove up to Oxford about a 70 mile trip and William enrolled in college. John Henry had never been on a university campus and he didn't like the college atmosphere. He was a smart man and could do a lot of things, including keep a beautiful set of books for the store. He liked to trade cattle, grow cotton, and sit around a wood stove in the store in the wintertime and play checkers. He did the right thing as far as he was concerned and lived to be 87 years old, but college was out of his comfort zone. After William got checked in at Oxford, John Henry pulled out his watch and looked at it and said, well, we'd better be getting home now. He couldn't get out of there fast enough. The judge later told William that when they got down the road a piece, John Henry said, I believe I'd rather go four years in the penitentiary than to stay around here. He didn't like school at all, but he knew better than discouraging education in front of Betsy. One of the biggest problems at college was severe homesickness. It seemed like hundreds of miles from home to William. But that didn't last too long. There were other problems more serious. Chemistry and inorganic chemistry were required to get into medical school. Things started off not looking so good because his first chemistry quiz grade was a 78. He knew that would never get him into medical school. So he went down to see a fellow named Anderson who was working on his master's degree. William said, I got to do better than this 78 on chemistry. Any suggestions? Anderson said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I work every Saturday afternoon on this distilling apparatus that I'm doing my thesis on. If you come down here, I'll give you problems and I'll bring a slide rule to see that you get it. So for his freshman year, he spent every Saturday afternoon down there with Anderson while his friends were going to the movies, concerts, and just having fun. About two weeks before classes turned out for the Christmas holidays, Anderson came up to William's lab and said, Barnett, you got an A- minus in chemistry. I thought you'd like to know. Finding that out about the chemistry grade just before going home made William feel like a million dollars on the bus ride to Tuscola. When he got there, his mother, father, and uncle were all at the store to greet him. His best friend, Coot Brister, and his hunting dog, old Zan, were there too, ready to go quail hunting. He always took his German book home with him because when it rained you couldn't hunt, and he would go upstairs and build a fire in one of those fireplaces and sit down all afternoon and read, and nothing would interrupt you. You'd hear a rooster crow every once in a while. That was about all. After two years of college, William had to make application to medical school, and fortunately he was accepted. William graduated in three years at Mississippi, went to classes right through the summer, got a BS in chemistry, and made the honorary chemistry fraternity, so all those Saturday afternoons weren't wasted. But then, World War II started, and with the war, nobody knew what to expect. One day, while William was still away at school, a postcard arrived at the store in Tuscola addressed to William O. Barnett. It was from the draft board telling William to go to Carthage and sign up to be enlisted in the army. In other words, he was being drafted. That got Bessie a little upset. She was at the store and she sent Coot 
with a postcard down to where John Henry was working with some cattle. Then he got upset. He went right home and put on his suit. He always put on his suit before he went to Carthage and drove over to see Mr. White, who was head of the local draft board. John Henry asked Mr. White what that card meant, and Mr. White said, uh, Mr. Barnett, did uh, that boy of yours get accepted to the medical school or not? John Henry replied, yes, sir. He got accepted a couple of months ago. And Mr. White said, well, you don't have to worry about anything. We're not going to bother him. So William was ready to start medical school in April, and he was to take his first two years of med school at Oxford. But the next thing you know, they had changed things. They decided that it didn't look good with all of the draft age students walking around the campus with civilian clothes on while everybody else was in the army. So they decided the best way to handle that would be just to draft everybody into the army and issue them orders to go back to medical school. It turned out all right, but at the start, it was one of William's least enjoyable experiences. They put everybody on a bus with a sergeant who was in charge of the group. They went from Oxford down Highway 51 to Camp Shelby for a little army orientation. The medical students were given a test, and if you didn't score high enough on the test, they could flunk you out of medical school, and you would end up in the regular army. Everybody passed to the apparent dismay of the sergeant. When he found out they weren't going to Germany with the rest of them, he gave them KP duty every day out of spite. He said, okay, all you smart boys that are going back to school, I'll show you how smart you are. Here's 25 hampers of beans. I want them to all snap by 11 o'clock. Needless to say, everybody was glad to get back on campus. But from that point on, they wore a uniform to class and got up every morning to the sound of Reveille. The good part was that medical school didn't cost William's father a dime. The Army paid for it. By the time he graduated in 1945, the war was over. Before his discharge as an Air Force captain, he worked with a surgeon at a military hospital in Tampa, Florida, and that experience turned his life around. For three months, he was Colonel Murphy's first assistant. Just before his discharge, Dr. Murphy said to him, I've been observing you, and if you're interested, you've got what it takes to become a surgeon. Acting on Dr. Murphy's advice, William enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania for an eight-month course on the basic science of surgery. By now, he had a wife and a daughter, and they arrived in Philadelphia in an old worn-out taxi cab and a large bucket full of ice for the baby's milk. His wife, Dolores, a nurse he had met at a Tampa hospital, remembers that old cab. We drove that old beat-up taxi to Mississippi from Florida, and I remember driving through Mobile on the way. And we drove up this slope to a traffic light, and the car just quit. I said, what's wrong with the car? He said, I have no idea. I said, aren't you going to get out and pull the hood up and look? He said, I don't know why. I wouldn't know what I was looking at. I said, well, at least raise the hood and let people know we're in trouble. So he got out, but he couldn't get the hood up. He couldn't find the latch. And that's the way it would be for the rest of their married life. All William O. wanted to learn was how to be the best possible surgeon, and nothing else seemed to matter. He would do whatever it took to reach his goal, and that was to go back to Jackson, Mississippi, as a board-certified surgeon, and he did. He left Philadelphia, completed his internship in Baltimore, and for the next three decades, he was a surgeon in Jackson. He was no longer William O. He was now Dr. Barnett, general surgeon. In addition to his private practice, which was small in the beginning,